Well, the exam will be pretty similar to the previous exam. Yeah, and just to make sure everyone knows, next week on Thursday, we have a little exam. And so what's going to happen is the exam's going to cover material up through this week. Um, and then on Tuesday will be people call review, but if you got questions. So everything up to the end of the school potentially be on the exam? Correct. So any other questions? Yeah, so the question is, if there's a question about which pattern would you use in, condition, in this condition, and you think there's three patterns which would apply, um, usually I've started wording, you know, say, give me a pattern or give me one pattern. Um, the reason is people say, okay, I'll write down five patterns, right? And then two would be right and three would be wrong. And then what do you do? Oh. What I do is I grade the wrong ones wrong, right? Um, and that's, you know, word of warning, particularly people who were trained in India. Um, apparently in exams in India, the goal is to write down as much as possible, right? Absolutely, you have to write down more than anyone else. Um, And the, the problem becomes, you know, say you write on five paragraphs, right? And the, the first sentence, the second paragraph answers the question. And then I read and go, well, what are the other three paragraphs for? Because you, you answered the question, but apparently you didn't realize you answered the question. So you're not really sure what the answer is, right? You're just like, we got this saying in this country about throwing spaghetti in the wall to see what sticks, right? You're just throwing all the spaghetti you got at the wall and hoping something sticks and I'm supposed to pick out the right answer? Like, no. If you write something that's wrong, even though the right answer is there and there's something wrong here, it's like, okay, you lose points because clearly um, you understood and then something wrong, right? Plus you're like, you're writing this much. Um, when, when you already answered the question, it's like, why are you... Why are you wasting all your time writing all this extra stuff, right? You know, I once, I once had a high school student take this course. I mean, uh, back then I told us, you know, let's just answer the question, right? And he was great. He was like, oh, I could answer, you could answer this question in five words. He put down just five words, right? He said, oh, yeah. It's like, yes. So I know I knew he knew the answer, right? Yes. Um, when students like memorize stuff and then they repeat what they memorize, I go, I'm not sure they really understand anything because all they're doing is repeating exactly what they've memorized. And it's clearly a different way, way of education. We once had you know, someone in our department was from India, and at one point one of the students said, oh yeah, he just, he gave us a list of 100 questions, and he gave us 100 answers for each one, and they were just memorizing all the answers he gave out, and I was like, what? Because I could write a computer program that will answer those questions better, right? Faster and more accurately, if you know, if it's only 100 questions, there's only 100 answers, I mean, done, right? But it doesn't necessarily show any understanding of what, what's going on.
Any other question? So next Tuesday, if you're too embarrassed to ask a question, what you want to do is write it down and pass it to her, and she'll ask it for you, right? Right? Particularly if you pass like a $5 bill with it. So last time we're sort of taking a break from all these patterns. Uh, I'm looking at this, it's called the solid <laughs> principle. Um, and we saw the Liskov substitution principle last time, which talked about, you know, basically it says a subclass should be able to replace the parent class. And it really means in terms of this, the child class should have the same behavior as a parent class. Um, and you look at this rectangle and square. I also find that you often know, to use inheritance. In Java, you, you have to because you have to inherit from object. But how many times do you create classes which are subclasses of something besides object? When you're building frameworks, I see that happening because you're, you're building up structure, right? So I think, yeah, he was wrong. You know, the interface segregation principle. You know, an example of a modem, right? There were two different types of things. We get two different interfaces. And yeah, if you want, you may implement both at the same time, but they're different interfaces, right? So you can treat things as one or the other. Um, and you see that somewhat in Java, right? But it's, you now there's different interfaces for different type, you know, mouse move, you know. They create a bunch of the interfaces that you can now. In part because initially they didn't do that, right? And they're just used broadcast events. And there was, there was too much noise, too many events. The system was too slow. So they could now just listen to one event you're interested in. Um, Right. Um, and I think the very first day we talked about what's good about object-oriented programming, and it's supposed to be it's flexible, um, and we make changes, you know, propagate, um, and you should be able to use things, should we use them, right? And I think anyone that's done any and it's never going to work, it's going to run across these problems. It's just, it's so easy for things to get tangled together and you just can't separate them and then changes just sort of propagate the system. Um, right? And so whatever a module is, they get intertwined. Um, And so that leads to the D, right, and the solid. Right. We don't want the low level, the high level stuff to depend on low level stuff. We may want to change that. You know, when you're reading a, when you're reading data, you read from a file. That's a different way of reading files. 
than just say from a database or from the network, right? But you may want the flexibility of changing where the data comes from. Um, Right, so in our movie example, right, you know, movie lists are dependent upon that, and so we're stuck, right? But now if we, we have an interface, right, um, now the movie lister can be coupled or depends upon the movie finder interface and not the concrete implementation. So if you only have one concrete class, then you recommend making an interface just to be for safe instead of realizing you can make it more later. Um, you know what I'm saying? Because otherwise, right. it seems like almost every concrete class is an interface and just pass it around. Yeah, so that. So the answer to your question depends upon several parameters. One is, how difficult is it for you to change the system, right? Um, so the question is, if we start with this, right? And then we realize, okay, we need to change. Um, and so we wanna swap that out to the interface, how hard is that gonna be? If the answer is, well, that's, in this case, you know, it's a two-minute fix, right? So, okay, then don't worry about it because it's a two-minute fix, right? And making your design more complicated to avoid a two-minute fix later in the future is like... So that's one question is, right, you know, what is... How hard will it be to fix it, right? Um, and if it's easy to fix it later on, then... It, Probably not worth it. And what do you know about future requirements? Right, yes. You know, so the agile people like. Someone has breakfast only once, grade only once, and there's only one in one class. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about single responsibility, right? Um, so in my mind, the first problem with that principle is what's the responsibility? which isn't your question yet. Um, how do you know what that single responsibility is? That requires you to figure out what that abstraction we're talking about. Um, but eventually we have to get both things done, right? Um, and so you might have in relation to a responsibility and this responsibility, but then we have to combine them together, right, to build application. And so at some point they'll come together. So then it's like, well, how, how does that work? Because now, even if we build a class to do, in the modem case, it was one making the connection, right, and the other one um, to manage the connection or s send data. Um, but at some point the application has to do both. Um, So at some point, yeah, we have to combine them into to one thing, right? Um, so how does that satisfy the single responsibility principle? Anyone?
Do you understand the question? Yeah, so let's say we have a class that makes the connection, right? Does all the handshaking, whatever it is. Um, we have another class that actually, you know, transmits data and receives data. But now we need to put it together, right? So we have a third class that uses those two classes to actually do what? Well, make the connection and do the communication, right? Yeah, so that becomes the issue. Then we talk about different levels of responsibility, right? Um, you know, in, in the movie finder, right, the different tasks we have to solve. One is that we have to, we have to get the data, right? So obtaining the data is one responsibility, um, but and here it's delegated right to someone else. You still need that information. <coughs> but now going back to your question, right, when you read the article, he sort of hems and haws a little bit as he says, Yeah, here we need we should break it in these two separate interfaces, right? But then he has one class to them both. Um and he sort of hems and haws why he did that a little bit. You know, he, he doesn't go all the way and break it completely into two pieces and then combine those pieces together. I think partly because it's already there, right? And so like, why break it, break it up when there's no need yet? Any other questions? You know, and here I give an example of a copy program where you want to have the reader and writer aspect. Um, so again, you get, well, now we feel, we, we see this, um, separation in Java, right? Because when you want to have input source, you get a stream or a reader, right? And that stream could be connected to a file, it could be connected to a string, or it could be connected to a network socket. All right, and so in Java, they, they do that separation for us, right? They, there's a reader interface, and so our programs now get tied into, right, the reader interface, not a file per se or a socket or a string. And I was just again saying, you know, once we you know, have our copy program to read a file and print it out and read explicitly from the keyboard, right, that limits its functionality. Right, if we tie it to the reader interface and now there's a keyboard reader or a file reader 
or network reader, then we can now change that lower, lower, we're no longer dependent on that low level service. Now, if you're writing a throwaway program, right, to do this for some reason, right, it's fine, but then you have to realize, okay, it's you're not going to be able to modify it, right? We're stuck. Or if we if we do modify it, it better be we're going to have to separate these responsibilities out. Question. So this whole solid topic is kind of uh, overlapping. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, basically, you know, writing a software is hard, right? Um, it it's very technical. It's very detailed. Um, it takes people, teams, to do it. Um, it takes a long time. And we haven't been doing it for very long. I mean, look at mathematics, how long it took them to sort of formalize things. It took them centuries, right? And there's fewer people involved. And it's like, okay, Newton creates calculus, right? Leibniz creates calculus. And then we spend, you know, years trying to figure out the notation. There's only a few people involved, right? And you can do that. You can go in your office and think about it and write a paper and talk to your colleague and then, right? But in the software world, you know, we need compilers and languages. And you know, that takes, that's, that's a 10 or 15 year project. You have to think of, you know, I need a language, okay. Um, Java took like two or three years to develop. And then you have to sort of get people to use it to get the feedback. So it takes, and you need, no, language aren't good enough. You need libraries and IDEs, right, and all the tools that come with it. Um, and then you want to get the response back. You see how it works, right? And that's, you know, a 10, 15, 20-year project. And then re reiterate. Um, and we're starting to figure, you know, how do we get the right tools? How do we write software? And so people are struggling with, I'm sure they won't use the word struggling, but trying to figure out what aspect of it can we, what metrics can we use, what ideas can we use to make software better. And come back in 200 years and we'll have a better way of doing it. And hopefully our languages will be better, our tools will be better. But... And there's another concept people use to try and you know, how do we, what aspect of software do we look at so we can avoid all these problems we talk about, right? And one is coupling. Um, and now this seems like it's 1972, seems like, a, I mean, it's before mostly we were born, right? Um, in some cases, even maybe your parents were born now. Um, so it seems like a long time ago, but historically, it's a short time. Um, and so Parnas wrote this paper, um, and in today's world, what he did seemed almost trivial, right? It's like, 
um, this keyword in context program. Um, so here's a description of what you're supposed to do, right? You read in a file, you read in a file with a bunch of strings, right? Um, of course, in 72, it was probably maybe in punch cards or who knows what it was. Um, read a line of words, and then you basically you know, create all circular shifts of all lines in alphabetical order, right? So you take all the words in a line, you put them in order, and you create all circular shifts. You take, so you take the first word and you put it at the end, and that's one, you know, and you just keep on, and you create all of them, right? Which seems like that's a pretty small program these days. Um, and so he writes his paper and he says, look, um, you know, how should we design that program? And so the one common solution was, in that time, a module basically was a function. Um, so each major step in the processing became a function. Um, And the second way, what they did is, okay, we're gonna, for every design decision we have to make, to do it this way or that way, well, that's what determines what a function is gonna do or a module is gonna do, right? If I have to make a decision, okay, I'll put that, I hide each decision in a module. Um, now the problem is, when I think of problems, and I'm sure most, some of you do too, it's like, okay, what do I have to do to solve this problem, right? Well, first I have to read the file. Open the file, read the file, read a line, okay. Now I got a line. Next thing I have to do is I have to partition into words, right? Um, once I get that partition into words, then I need to sort them. And now I have to then take the first thing and you know, make a copy, right? And, Move it and another thing, right? And so we build this flow chart, at least in my head, right? First I do A, then I do B, then I do C, right? Um, and so what this first solution is basically taking that flow chart in your head, right? And making that drive the architecture of the, of the program. which is not what the second solution is doing. And, you know, so they, they did the experiment, they had several programmers write, do, you know, write different ways and look at the result. And they said, yeah, solution one becomes more complex. And often when I look at students' homeworks and assignments, what I see happening is solution one. Right, in your very first assignment, right, um, where would the print statement go? Well, it went in the middle of the list, right? Why did it go there? Well, it's because well, what was assignment one again? You had to build, build this queue, right? And so you start thinking, what do I have to do to build a queue? I need, well, I need a node, it has to be doubly linked, right? And it has to hold processes, right? So you start building this, first I do A, then I do B, then I do C, right? And then when it came time to print things out, it was like, well, I'm, I've just did C, so, I'll do it there, right? Whereas solution two is like, okay, now we're, we have to figure out what our design decisions are going to be. Oh, 
And so Q, so Qs could be either linked list or not linked list. So how do I hide that decision from the world, right? When you print things out, where does it go? Well, maybe I better hide, how do I hide that decision in the world? And so this whole paper started off this whole thing about how do we, about structure design, how do we um, do design decisions. Um, and I want to look at a couple ideas people come up with, that, again, try and talk about how do we make our, our software better. One is coupling and one is cohesion. And coupling is just two things that are coupled together. If you know, if class A uses class B, right, then they're they're, they're coupled, right? Um, and then potentially, if I change class B, that that may affect class A, right? It also means I can't if I want to use class A in a different context. Since it uses class B, I then have to pull class B with it, right? So they're tied together. Um, cohesion um, is basically how well the things fit together, right? Um, when I look at a class, how well does everything belong in that class or not? Um, so first I want to look at Today we'll look at coupling. If we get far enough, we'll look at cohesion next time. Um, now, when I look at software engineering textbooks, there's usually like one page that talks about coupling and cohesion. And you know, basically, it boils down to coupling's bad and cohesion's good. Um, But it, that's not particularly useful, but that doesn't tell me, whenever I read about software development, so I go, okay, how do I use this idea or concept in this program or what I'm doing here or here, right? If I, if I can't apply it, then it may be a great idea, but it's not helping me. Um, and that may be my fault, or it could be the idea's fault, or it could be just, I don't work on big enough projects, but Right, it's not helpful to me. Um, and so the paper is pretty old now. It came in the 90s. Um, where he, just, he was actually a consultant. Um, uh, and he just wanted to understand what types of coupling cohesion are there, how do they relate. Um, and so he wrote this. He actually did this whole thing as a series of, well, these days we call it a blog articles, but no, they were just um, news group postings. Um, this was back when news group postings were the, what everyone did as opposed to writing blog articles. Um, yeah, I was like, Yes, but um, how is it unnecessary, right? Um, again, it sounds great, but it's okay. Yeah, if, if unnecessary coupling is going to make things harder to deal with. So, how do we know what's not necessary, right? Um, so yeah. So there's two things here, right? Um, the first one is talk about interaction of two components at the same level of abstraction. So there's only a word about things at the same level of traction. So in the 
Um, the copy program, right? The reading and writing are lower level abstraction. And then as weak as possible, um, it's not going to be non-existent because if there's no coupling, you can't, I mean, if you've got a module or a class or a function that's not coupled to anything in your program, just get rid of it. It's gone, right? And you haven't lost anything. So he comes up with a bu you know, bunch of different types of coupling and ranks them from good, from good to bad, or most desirable, right, to least desirable. Um, so that coupling is just, they're coupled together because Input of one is the output of the other, right? Um, and so then we have to talk about, at the time of writing now, but your only program is fairly new. And so he was like, all, all literature talks about functions. Now we talk about objects. And so one common occurrence, right? Um, Right, so object A passes some object X to B, and now um, B and X are, are tied together. Um, you know, so you know, simple examples I pass in some object as a parameter to a method in class B. Right, and then we use class X to do something. Now it, those are coupled together, right? So even though data coupling may be the, the most desirable, it's a problem, right? You know, what happens if I pass some type in and then I extract something from that, that type? So what happens if some type is say a person object and I get, I get, it's not get Y, but get name, right? And then I return a string, that's your name, right? Then later we decide, well, you know, names are a bit more complicated than we thought because there's different languages and they've got different conventions. Um, you know, what's the name and the first name and last name and family name and surname and, right? Um, and so now I create, have my person object store not a string for name, but a, per, a name object, right? And now when I say get name, I no longer get a string, I get a name object. And now this has to change, right? So a change internally to some type, right, can affect um, what's happening here. So how do we deal with that? I feel like I'm kind of lucky. It's a simple. 
you've been involved in the product, the customer. So, mm -hmm. I, so I've had an idea of what was likely not to change, what was likely to change, what was likely to change. That kind of stuff. It seems like because you need to have you need to have some things that are that are yeah in place that are in this now because otherwise it's like analysis paralysis. You're gonna you're gonna make everything so flexible and nothing. Right. So so I feel like in, in tackling this problem, and it's probably a problem in all industries because you got one group that knows the product and, and what might happen to it, and you've got another other programs that even you give us assignments, you know, we take that as concrete. Right. But we don't know that you could be a manager who's thinking, okay, person two's gonna take from this and then customer say right. you know, Go that way. Happen. Yeah, go that way, yeah. Yeah, so I just feel like you know, knowing what what could change about your product is kind of is kind of a necessary input. Otherwise, you know, a lot of it's theoretical. At some point you know something. And I mean, I mean, really, I mean, this is kind of like the base class for like all the code smells, design patterns, yeah. and all that, because they're all trying to decrease. Yeah. They're all trying to couple in a flexible way, right? And in, in a generic way. But in in the large design, I feel like you also have to know some kind of boundary. This is the stuff that's less likely to change. This is the stuff. And then you can. Yeah, and if you, the um, agile people, right, um, have the abbreviation, you're not going to need it, um, and they say, yeah, I mean, people overreacted to overdesign things, so it becomes harder to manage later on. So just do exactly what you need now. And then when you need the flexibility later, you modify it. But you have to be careful because they also um, have, you see, but you have to, they're still planning for the future, right? And instead of, okay, we're going to write tests, we're going to do all the infrastructure to make it easier for us to change our code. Um, and so the two are tied together, right? And I, you know, when Agile program was first coming out, um, I spent a year on sabbatical in Illinois, and I mean, actually, with a couple of graduate students there, one guy, he just got. He decided he didn't like academics anymore. He, he was going to go to industry. So he he went to interviewed in San Francisco. Of course, he's like, you know, that's where all jobs were, right? Hot place. And he came back. He said, you know, everyone said they were doing agile development. But when I looked at what they were doing, they weren't, right? Um, they're like, okay, we don't need to worry about design for the future, right? So they just were just hacking away. And but they weren't writing tests. They weren't, you know, pair programming. They weren't doing all these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, it it helps. It really helps to know what could possibly change. But you're that's only you don't know for certain. There's a certain probability, right? This is more likely to change, and that to change, right? Paid another company for this whole model. Mm -hmm. We gave them exact spec. We knew what we were doing. We ended up having to throw it all away and throw a number of different things. But one of them was they tried to build in all this stuff. But, well, if you need to change this, we build this right. complex thing to where this thing changed. We already know. You know that's not something that's right. likely to change. And you, you made it yeah. five times more complex. And there was a number of places where they did that. And you know, those became one of the reasons why we had to throw it all out. But it's just kind of an example of where, you know. <laughs> it's indeed you know, the, the whole you won't need it. Yeah. Um, it's kind yeah. Of yeah, my goal here, right, is um, if we don't understand coupling cohesion, right, um, it makes it harder to think about the software. 
Yeah, I guess more important. Things can be right. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, they can also be right. When people turn to air, they make it over to topple or they make it over. Yeah, and basically, the analogy I use is like, like a certain, we need flexibility at certain points, right? Um, and I left them, I didn't get the other piece. I got another one, you know, there's like 15 hinges put together, right? And you, you can't do anything with it. You hold it up and it's like, right? It's, it's so flexible, you can't do anything. Um, yeah, you need the right flexibility. Um, and the goal here is, you know, how do we get that? Uh, or how do we find where things are too coupled? We may not do anything about it, but once you have the ideas down, it becomes easier to spot places where, right? Right? And the simple example to talk about sorting, right? How do we how do we sort a general list? Well, you know, I have a student record with the names and IDs and a bunch of other stuff. Um, how do I sort that? Well, um, you know, here if I'm I'm grabbing the name out, um, I, I'm only being able to sort student records by name, right? Not very useful. Um, the problem is, yeah, like I said, what happens if instead of a name string, it becomes a name object. Now I have to change the sort algorithm. Um, you know, then we can ask the, you know, put a, some sort of method in the student object to compare with another one. Um, and now when I sort them, I just use that method and all of a sudden my sort algorithm doesn't know anything about the student object except that compare operation. Right, we're not making, the sort doesn't know, is not as coupled, tightly coupled to the student object. it doesn't have to worry about the internal representation of how it stores the data. You know, they can you know, create some sort of comparable, right? Um, you know, Java has this comparator and it's like plus, minus, I mean, what? It's negative, positive, zero. Um, and then you have the student implement the comparable, right? Now all of a sudden, you know, our sort, our sort, our sort list um, is not coupled to that interface, not the actual student object. And now the coupling is looser, right? So now I can. Anything in that interface can now be sorted as opposed to only sorting student objects. Right, so I start off with it. The temp one, right, the sort algorithm is using and extracting internal structures from the student objects. And that was really tightly coupled how internal implementation, adding a compare method to the student object, get rid of that make an inter interface, right, for that. Now, now, all of a sudden, it's much more flexible. Like in any object, there's an interface, we can now use this sort list to sort them, right? Um, make an interface, right? So now we're, we're separating out that responsibility to be by itself, 
Right. How do you compare two objects? You're still, you're not really, you know, you're still assuming that they're really going to want less than greater. Than, or, or, it'd be better to just say, how do you want two objects? You know, how should I compare these objects? You want less than, how should I compare these objects greater than, how should I? That might be a tough five. <laughs> it just seems like it's just one comparing. Yeah, but the, what's cool? the difference here is now, um, you know, attempt three, right, is um, I only have one way to compare objects. And as I build it into, um, Student influence comparable, and that means I can only compare them one way. Here I can sort them by name, but I don't want to sort them by ID, or I don't want to sort them by grade, or by anything. Else. Right? I can't do that without modifying my student object. I don't, I'm not sure. How temp four is? Oh. Um, it's an interface, right? And we pass in the two objects. And so the difference is, right, I give an object, so here's how you compare object A and object B. And that method's not in the object itself. Right, which is what you do in Java, right? In Java, you give it a comparator, it can tell you how to compare A and B. Now I can compare student objects by name, by grade. I can compare other types of objects. You know, all I have to do is Do is derive a class for comparing yeah. for every single. Yeah, right. Just all this kind of stuff. Glad that lens. Right, yeah. That's. Um, so you have to do all this stuff, right? And then you just. Right, in Java now. You have the comparator thing, right? Um, and so you can pass in a comparator object, and then a lambda will act as a comparator. So I just do it in line. But the, the key idea is here, right? We start with something. And you pass in a student object, and we pull out structures from the student object, and that tightly coupled the student object to our sort list, right? Which means that sort of list is, can only work on student objects. And then we can reduce that coupling by having the student object say, you know, compare yourself to this guy, right? But we're still tuple, coupled from the student, the sort of list to a student object, right? Making some sort of comparator interface where we pass in a separate object or lambda that does the comparing, right? Gives us far less coupling because now the sort of list is coupled to that comparator interface, not a student object directly. Right, yeah. In fact, even I think a Java compare to is that for the right. one, you've got to make sure they're the same. Compatible, and then you got 
It's all these extra steps because a dog is the end. You right. may not necessarily be there on the scene at the time, but now you can only do it when it's fast. Right. And so we need a name, right? And so, you know, someone talked about the functor pattern where it's, you're basically creating a function that acts like an object. And for a long time, Java had a lot of interfaces which had just one method in it, right? It's like, now you can create class and like for, for, as one method, I mean, And so that, you know, sort of leads us to, instead of being coupled to the actual data, be coupled to an interface, right? And that gives you more flexibility than being coupled to a particular class. Right, I mean, typical examples, ask for an iterator in job, what do you get? Well, there's an iterator face, and so you get something influence that interface, and so you don't know what you get, right? So we don't have to worry about being end up tied up to a arraylist iterator. This next type of coupling was control coupling. Um, You're ba basically passing in sort of flag to control how things work. Um, or the sequencing. Um, and so a typical you know, example it gives us you're passing in this basically a flag, you say, well, what do you do in these cases? And the problem here is, how do I know what values to put in, right, to do what? I have to know the values are zero, one, and two, right? And what does zero do? What does one do? So I need informa information internal to the method to know what to put in there to make it work. So I'm not even, in this case, I'm not even coupled to the interface of the object. I'm coupled to, I have to know how it works and what those numbers mean. What's that? Yeah, so we can we can reduce the coupling by one is having some sort of interface that tells us tells us what the values are. That helps, right? Because no longer have to go to the source code and look at it. Um, if there's an enum, right, that will define what the operations are. So now it makes it more explicit, right? Right, and you, you know. So we talked about as well, you can, the other way is, is make the operation explicit, right? Right. Right. Yeah, we all do that, right? I mean, oh, we could do it this way.
right? But then it, it becomes explicit, you know, turn it on, turn it off, turn it blank. With well, enum, we sort of get this, we get almost the same thing, right? It's, you know, light status dot on, light status dot off. So is this control coupling? Should we take a poll? What's that? Yes, um, but what is control coupling? <laughs> yeah, you have to keep in mind, right? Right. Control coupling is passing some sort of flag to control the sequence that the module uses, right? So here, right, we the setting is going to specify what happens, right? Here, we're just telling you to do something, right? It's, the amount does not change what happens, right? What about this? Yeah, we, we just passed the parameter and we're using that parameter, right? Yeah, every once in a while, someone suggests what we should do is have a cell signal blocker, right, so that that doesn't happen. But A, that's probably illegal. And B, there are times when it could be a bad idea. I mean, if someone's on call, right, and, you know, at least they don't have any medical doctors here, but, you know, what if there's... You know, you're a support on the support team, right? And you're on call and something went wrong and you need to respond right now or and you're in a room that has a cell blocker so you can't get the signal. And your company loses millions of dollars because your server's down and Yeah, so control coupling is not just passing an argument, right? It's actually passing a flag that specifies what operation should be done inside. Well, with the previous example, right, um, 
you know, I pick a particular value to do a particular thing, right? Zero does this, one does that. Completely different things. What I want to happen, I'll pick one. Um, Here we don't we don't pick a particular amount to cause one or the other to happen, right? It's like oh no, the person actually wants to try and withdraw this amount of money, um, so we're not picking that amount to, to control what happens inside, right? It's just the person wants to draw a million dollars in their account, and they don't only have ten dollars in their account, so okay, our reaction will be different. So I saw that's different than picking a million dollars to, to make some, something happen. Right, 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 right. Would you then want to have 50 methods on the <laughs> yeah. I've no what they would I have no idea what they would be, right? Or something, yeah. Um what do you want then? Fifty different methods? What's that? So they're gonna could be, or we, or we just, you know, the goal is to have the weakest coupling as possible, right? Um, that doesn't mean we there aren't situations where we might want to use control coupling. It just makes more, you know, may more sense in this situation to just bite the bullet and have a large enum that specifies the names of all the different things so I know have some idea what 39 does as opposed to 30, 38, right? Yeah, but the same idea of using num, right? Is just you encapsulate the very the, yeah. It all depends on your language. Um, in Swift, the enum is almost the same status as a class. You can have methods and you can have um, parameters or, or, or properties. The other place is a control coupling is reversed, right? A function return or method returns something, right? And we use that to control what happens afterwards. And you know, a common example of that is returning some sort of status flag. And of course, again, part of the problem here is that what are the what are the legal values of the flag? Um, it's a common case is int, right? Clearly, not all integers are going to be, be, be returned, right? There's going to be a small set of integers that are returned, and what do they mean? 
Um, and so here's, um, right, so we, we have all these checks. Um, and so he, he suggests that the cure is to use exceptions. And of course, in the Java world, that makes it exceptions make the two paths separate, right, and explicit, because there's a regular case. I just call a call a method and keep on going, and the exception case must throw exceptions that leads us to a different, you know, leads us to the the catch instead of the regular case. And exceptions are falling out of favor, um, in part because in Java, people got tired of try, catch, try, catch, try, catch. And then like, oh, you got catch this, catch, 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 right? And I'll get tired of that, so I'll just put catch exception. And then what do we do? Oh, I'll know, I'll just eat it, right? I'll just try catch and then empty catch block and like, um, so people are now using optionals to try and get replace exceptions. In another five or ten years, we'll see if people still like optional. Right, so people are you know, now I'm using optionals. Um, well, so an example in Swift is if I got a string and I convert to integer, right? Um, so, so you have a, fun a function you call to convert the string to integer. What can return? Well, the problem is what happens when the string is does not represent an integer? What do you do? Right? In Java, you'd either return a null or you'd throw an exception. Um, here, we return an, an optional. An optional either has a value or it's nil. Um, and so in Swift, you do something like Put it like this, and now when you convert it to an integer, you get back an optional. If it was not a string, then not represented as an integer. Um, and then it allows us to do things like, well, you, know, you either check, like you do it with, with try catch blocks, or you can just send it a message, and if it's nil, it won't do anything. Um, so this is, you know, what languages are now trying to use instead of try catch blocks. Right. So you have one way to throw exceptions, one to return an optional, and then you have to check. It's not clear to me whether one is better than the other, but. Most of the newer languages, Swift, Kotlin, embed optionals, and now Java has also added optionals to their repertoire, too. So with the optional, is that usually implemented so it can replace the means? You say if the optional is there. Uh, uh, no, it's, 
what this does what this if let does is if it's null then you do the else case otherwise you do the well that's from the left yeah that's from the left. yeah yeah So either the let is successful or not, right? It's sort of weird syntax. It's sort of weird syntax. Yeah. Right, yeah. So you're asking for give me the value. If there's no value there, then the let returns false. Right, yeah, exactly. So it is, it's a test for null, yeah. We'll start here next time.